essentially what we've done is we've been able to take um, AIS data from vessels and run it through an algorithm to figure out where the vessels are fishing on the globe. And, um, and then we plot that on a map, um, which I hope you're going to be able to see in a second. Yeah, I see it now. Uh, quick question. Is this, so this is significantly different than, I mean, there are mechanisms already online to chart any, any ship location. They, you know, hour by hour, but that's for commercial vessels. I don't know if that includes fishing vessels. Right. Um, so that's the thing. Um, you can look at them hour by hour. We used to have, or we still have, an analyst in Spain who would, who would literally watch certain vessels hour by hour and plot out where they were. Uh -huh. And based on the track that she was able to, you know, discern from that, she could tell when they were fishing. Okay. But she did it for one vessel at a time. It took hours and hours and hours. Just to plot out that track. So what we've done is we've built an algorithm to do what she used to do, and now we can do it for all the vessels in the world um, at any time, up until near real time, and see everywhere they go um, all around the world. One thing we did that was kind of cool is we zoomed in on this area here, which is the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. It's part of the Republic of Kiribati, mm -hmm. and um, this has been a World Heritage Site for many years. Um, but it's still allowed fishing. And you can see all the fishing that's going on here um, at the end of 2014 where I selected this time frame. Um, it's a World Heritage Site. Obviously, it's an area that deserves protection, but it doesn't get it. It's what people would refer to as a paper park. Um, and the president of Kiribati had been under some pressure about this uh, for some time. And at the first Our Ocean Conference two years ago, he said, um, he would make this into a no-take marine protected area as of the 1st of January, 2016. And so we were able, because we were developing Global Fishing Watch then, we were able to watch to see what happened. And if I hit play and the time slider will start moving, you'll see as we start moving into January, um, this time frame, there aren't um, as many vessels fishing. And when we get to the point where we're only looking at January 2015 and later, you see there aren't, the vessels did in fact stop fishing in the Phoenix Islands protected area. So Amazing. we're able to show that, you know, it isn't a paper park at this point. But we decided to continue watching and we spotted this vessel, which is, you can see on the right hand side, it's called the Marshall 203, um, where um, actually it's a great um, example because it has its IMO number, it has its flag, it has its NMSI call sign, very well identified vessel, and we watch what it does, and it's fishing outside of Phoenix Island's protected area, and then in June and July, it comes back, yeah. and you can see what happened. Um, it started fishing in an area that it wasn't supposed to be fishing in. Now, the authorities had spotted this vessel and had tried to assess a fine, but the captain basically said, look, I was in the um, I was in the area, but I wasn't fishing. And they had VMS data, which is the uh, vessel monitoring system data that governments often use. Um, it's typically private data that only governments have access to. U.S. has a VMS data system, for example, and so does um, Kiribati. And so they could see the vessel's VMS, but it only was pinging um, every maybe four hours or something like that. And it wasn't enough to, to really demonstrate, uh, wasn't rigorous enough to really demonstrate a fishing pattern. Mm -hmm. But AIS, um, AIS actually gives off a signal um, multiple times every minute. And the satellites don't pick them all up, but they pick up a lot of those. And so you get um, a very much more clear picture of what was happening. And so this information was provided to, the, to Kiribati, and they took it, and they showed it to the captain, and the captain realized he had been caught and agreed to pay a $1 million fine plus a $1 million contribution, whatever that means, um, to Kiribati. So $2 million assessed as a result of, um, of, this, of this picture we were able to show. And that's for a country that has a $200 million GDP. This is another example. This is a vessel off the coast of um, Chile, which is called the Don Tito, and it's a Chilean vessel. It's allowed to fish in the Chilean exclusive economic zone, as far as we know. Um, so that's all good. But when we watch this vessel, it does something peculiar. 
which is it's you know it's inland. It's filling in and out of the port there in um, mm. Chile, and then all of a sudden it shoots out just outside of the exclusive economic zone boundary for a very brief period of time and comes back in. So that's a lot of fuel. So if you really want to get out there for something. Yeah. It's possible that what we're looking at here is sort of one side of a, a transshipment um, activity where he's meeting up with a refrigerated vessel, mm -hmm. um, unloading his fish, so he doesn't have to maybe, um, you know, report them against his quota. Mm -hmm. um, and that there are quotas, for example, Jack Mackerel in that area. We have a team working down there on this. Um, so it's possible that it's, it's transshipment behavior. Transshipment can be done for multiple reasons. One is, um, you know, to avoid quotas. Um, sure. With potential, with potential other reasons. And when you watch this vessel, you see he does it again. Uh, interesting. Uh, you know, she, I don't know. Um, anyway, multiple times we see this vessel. Um, Going out. <laughs> so now so, I'm showing you a large period of time, but you get the idea. Wouldn't there be a possibility of looking for other ship tracks that intersected with it at that spot? Because it's assuming yeah, it's, a refrigerated yeah. vessel would be big enough to be one of the ones that's registered that way. Yes, and there's a lot of things we can do. Yeah. Um, the refrigerated vessel um, we did not include in Global Fishing Watch because we were interested in fishing when we built it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we have the data and we can go back and look for that refrigerated vessel in those locations. And we have not found, um, we've done that. We haven't found it yet. Um, and that could be because this vessel is, is doing something that's improper and is turning off its AIS. Um, but we're going to keep looking. And what we're doing now is we're trying to identify other examples of, of this sort of behavior so that we can then train the, the computer through machine learning to find a pattern where then, kind of like my, I told you about my colleague in Spain, this is, we're kind of doing what she did now. We're looking at one vessel at a time. Mm -hmm. And if we can train the computer to actually go out and look for those, we can systematically identify a list of suspicious vessels that seem to be doing this. Then we can also identify, try to go back to that reefer data and find out who are they meeting up with. If we find one reefer, um, we can then say, okay, t to the data, tell me any other vessel that came within, you know, an eighth of a mile of this vessel and stayed there for, you know, a day or less. Right. And we can, um, then we can find even more vessels. Um, so we have a lot of ideas of things we can do that we haven't done yet. Um, but just to give you an idea of, again, the sort of the potential. Um, yeah. Thank you. Is there, I assume, you know, unfortunately, bad behavior is kind of like uh, it's always a, a chase, as has happened with cyber security and that kind of thing. And um, yeah. as, as, as the illicit fishing um, folk catch on to this, do they have the capacity to turn off their... Um, beacons and just go dark, kind of like, you know, uh, radar evading on the highway or uh, so many other things. Yeah, you can um, definitely, they can definitely turn it off, and that's one of the challenges that we have. Um, and we know that a lot of vessels turn it off, and there's a couple, that leads to a couple of different sort of thoughts. One is we can see them turn it off. Mm -hmm. So if they're cruising around um, and I don't know if I can find one for you on the fly, but you can actually, you know, see a vessel coming out, coming out, and then it disappears. Yeah. And then yeah. later it comes back in. And um, we can train, again, we can train um, a model to go through the data and find every vessel that was pinging, pinging, pinging. It's not, it's not within five miles sure. of the coast. Or it didn't go into port. Pinging, pinging, stops for a period of X, and then starts pinging again. Um, and we've done that, and we actually have some... Um, some data we're looking at um, on essentially what we call um, AIS avoidance or um, inconsistent AIS. Uh, we're trying to be a little bit politic about it because we don't want to, you know, get sued or anything. But we can list vessels that are doing that. We can rank it by country. Um, this is a, a project we're also working on that we're hoping that we can put together a report on. We haven't gotten there yet, but. Um, so we can expose the vessels that do that and expose the countries who, who are essentially not enforcing, um, you know, the laws. Um, that's, that's more, sorry? Oh, sorry. No, it's a very promising. Uh, I love what I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, there, the other piece to your to your question, though, is, is really kind of, I think, where we may be going with this, which is 
how do you stimulate better AIS use? How do you stimulate, this is great, this is really a huge step in increasing transparency on our oceans, but we can increase it even more if we actually got vessels to, you know, be more consistent with their AIS usage and get more vessels required to use it. So that you can imagine a whole set of policy goals that we could set, getting countries to require AIS, um, getting certifiers like the Marine Stewardship Council to, to only certify um, fisheries where the vessels are using AIS above 95% or something like that. Um, so so the, uh, the carrot to go with the stick, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Your insurance companies could say, well, your policy is contingent on your AIS being on. Mm. Um, they're insuring mm. these vessels. There's so many different ways. So like we're looking now at the new traceability rule that we're, we've been working for many years to get, um, we think is about to be finalized. If you're coming into port with traceability data that goes from the boat to the, to the port and it says the boat caught the fish in location X on date Y, the government could sample certain ones and say, all right, well, we've selected this one to test and your boat, yes, we see here that your boat was in that place. Here's the AIS data to prove it. Or, good, so you can come in. Or, no, I'm sorry, we don't see the vessel in that location. You're, you're, you don't check out. Your tra mm -hmm. tra uh, traceability data doesn't check out. Your, your shipment is refused. And then they're like, well, we just turned off our AIS, but we were there. Well, then next time don't turn off your AIS because you want to bring fish into this country. We, we need to be able to see where yeah. it's caught. Do you and currently, is, is there currently a list of vessels, uh, fishing vessels that, have a, a suspect pattern of turning on and off their AIS? Um, we're working on one, yeah. But we, it's not like public or anything, but we, yeah. we are working on it, yeah. Um, we can talk more about that at some point if you want. Um, it's interesting, yeah. right? and I, I'm really interested in that that sort of a combination of positive and negative reinforcement that could be involved, because um, I could even see this uh, eventually in other, well, uh, I won't go into terrestrial, the terrestrial questions seem different, but it, 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 there's such a black hole out there in terms of um, monitoring these areas. Uh, I, you know, I've written about the paradox of people who criticize uh, uh, Sea Shepherd, for example, for going into the Southern Ocean and tracking Japanese whaling, uh, but no one else is out there. <laughs> so it's like it's hard to say. Uh, right. you, you know, you can question some of their tactics, but but if they're not doing it, then then it's in a black hole. And this kind of says there's a way to fill that hole. Right, exactly. And um, can, can you run through just one more example? Like, where is there some place there you could just go to right away, like off the coast of Africa, where you know there's no governance, but you see a lot of fishing, and you know. Yeah. See... Yeah, there are some places like that. Um, or maybe around Madagascar. Or... It's hard to say. There's no governance. I think they have some like fishing agreements, you know, here. Yeah, I was. Um, that was clearly an overstatement, but. I mean, you know, yeah. generally, there must already be a sense of where the hotspots for opportunistic um, poaching essentially is. You know, that's a Namibian boat probably chartered, um, but there's, you know, I picked up a Vanuatu vessel, there's a Spanish vessel up in Namibia. So they have maybe some kind of local agreement with the country. Um, right. But, yeah, it's... Um, Fascinating. Some countries are not enforcing. Some countries, by by having the, they consider it enforcement because they have some sort of, you know, uh, fishing agreement with a vessel. But do they really know that that Japanese vessel is fishing that much in their EEZ? Right. Right. And right, are right. they really getting, you know, the right price for that license to do that? Given can, the, can you can you zoom in on that one? Just sort of get a little closer to that track. That's fascinating. So that's a Japanese ship. Yeah, that's a Japanese ship. Um, let me just turn this off so you can see the track better. Yeah. It's called the Wakashio Maru. Yeah. And you can see the track that it's making. Um, fascinating. Both inside this, inside this um, EZ and then also outside of it. So um, at, the, at the very least, there's a potential now for countries to say, hey, you're uh, you're you're in our you're on our highway, but you're not paying the toll essentially. Right, exactly. And before they had no idea who was on their highway. 